uh, resistor again and measure it one more time. go up scorching high like for sound effects and things like that but it definitely does the trick for music and actually this is quite a bit larger than a regular like dome tweeter this is I think about an inch and a half Pretty big. Let's measure it. Let's see. Inch and three quarter. All right, let's see how it measures. If you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. I think I'm at the point of diminishing returns here. Um, it came up, the level came up, and it's even back at baseline at, what is this, uh, like 12,000 or so? almost 13,000, which is right where, you know, personally my hearing disappears at. We're down from 13,000 to 7,500 or so. We take a dip. Uh, in here, from the crossover point on, it's fairly steady though. So this could be just an anomaly from being in an open environment and uh, you know the mic itself um, you could see I mean maybe it's picking up I don't know weird angles or something like that from it about the only way to know 100% for sure what the tweeter is doing is maybe move it uh, right up next to it and see what it does you could actually do it with all the drivers but I think if I had my choice I would probably just leave it like this I think I'd take the a little bit of extra sound pressure there compared to any little bit of smoothness it may have gained. Hey, good to see you. So today I'm going to go through some things on these uh, Jensen CS315 vintage speakers that uh, I want to try to take care of. I'm not sure exactly at what point I'm going to do it, but uh, they are near completion as far as, you know, I've got them dialed in um, for the most part. I want to do a little bit more with that. Uh, and then there's the aesthetics of it and then the longevity of it of the build itself. So um, thus far, you know, we have a basically a completed set of speakers. They're pretty much fine the way that they are. But like in my last video, you were seeing uh, that I was trying to uh, put the attenuator uh, on the tweeter and take it back off and measure it. And so 
I have this issue where the frequency range is okay, you know, and then at the tail end, like almost toward the end where you're not going to hear it anymore, it tends to just drop. Uh, and there's also a little bit of kind of hump, uh, kind of humps and stuff, spikes in the uh, mid range area. So they're not like super annoying or anything, but I'd like to get it smoother if I could. And so I'll, today, I think the first thing I'll do is experiment a little bit with um, that Zobel network that I put on there, as well as the two ohm resistor for the attenuator um, and try to figure out just exactly what's uh, happening and if I can make some changes and get that frequency response a little bit better on the top end. The other thing that I want to do is to take care of some of the miscellaneous things on these speakers. So uh, basically what I mean by that is that, well, one thing that you're going to see here before I even take the grill off is the grill is still bowed. And it's almost as if, let me get you on this one so you could see it a little bit better with the light behind us. You see that? So that, that would vibrate during some heavy use. And then up here, you see how it bows out? Same thing at the bottom. And that is, I, originally I thought it was because the speaker frames were warped. But it's not. It's uh, it's almost as if when Jensen made these, um, like these little grommets that hold it in, like maybe the where they placed them on the baffle was not correct for this, because these are kind of molded in. So by being a little bit too spread apart from you know vertically, it it tends to bow this frame. So I'm not going to relocate these. I'm not going to try to do any changes on here. And I've already tried straightening the frame once. And it just warps back again. So what I'm going to try to do is figure out a way to uh, support it in the middle here. Maybe with some foam, um, foam strips or something like that. Or actually what I think it's, it also hits this woofer. So... Uh, it was hitting the other one even worse than this one. But uh, for sure in here, it needs something to hold it out so it's not going to rattle. Uh, the other thing that's kind of driving me nuts is these ports. They stick out and, you know, they probably would look better if they were recessed. But I'm not going to go to all that trouble. But what I don't like is there's actually like a, a gap between here. So I'm going to take these back out and then put a piece of uh, foam sealing tape there and that'll close up that gap. As far as the the drivers that are in, uh, in here go, um, the tweeter is the one I'm going to be messing with today. I want to stick with this tweeter. I, I really like it. I like the way it looks. I like the way it sounds. And I think that it fits with the whole vintage uh, theme of this speaker. The, the PA full range speaker for the mid range. Um, I, I know it's probably not the greatest, uh, but it's a $25 speaker. It's high power. It's clear. It sounds pretty good. So I think that I'm going to keep that, but I might try to make it look prettier with, I've got a couple of these uh, trim rings that came off of some other uh, five inch drivers of mine from some old vintage uh, energy speakers and they fit perfectly on here but what I have to do is shave down this because it's got kind of like a you know a ridge inside of here that's holding it out but I think that, that would look nice and it would clean that up so I want to mess around with that the other thing that I'm considering doing is since I'm not going to use these Jensen woofers in this project, well, I don't want to scratch that speaker, but they have a, like a, a decorative ring on them. And I think it's just glued onto the, um, 
onto the front of the speaker. So I want to try to heat that up, see if I can heat it up and get it off easy enough. And then put it on this speaker and it would kind of give that a more finished look. So I want to do that. Um, the other thing that I want to do is inside of here, uh, my, my terminals for the speakers, I want to just clean that up, make sure it's as good as it can be. Um, I know that I, during this build, I had actually done, I had done some of them uh, with solder um, I took the old terminals from the old Jensen speakers and, you know, wrapped wire around them and soldered them. Uh, then I used some other, like, you know, cheapo, just steel or zinc or whatever, uh, connectors, insulated connectors on the other speakers and cr just crimped them on there. So I, I want to just clean all that up, make it really as good as I can make it. Um, yeah, so... That portion of it. Uh, other than that, I think really that's about where I'll probably you know end it at. Um, I think at that point they should be uh, good to go. I may do some you know testing or you know Jensen CS three fifteen verse you know whatever speaker just to see what happens. Uh, maybe try them at high volume in a bigger room and things like that. But I don't think that the build itself is going to change a whole lot from this other than those things I mentioned. So again, mess around with the tweeter to try to get that up and level, um, making them prettier with those rings, uh, putting a gasket behind there. So, uh, oh, and fixing the grill so it doesn't rattle, just putting some pads on there. Um, so yeah, those are the last few things that I'll do. And I'm not sure how many videos it'll take. I know the other videos were longer during the build process and everything. So that was uh, kind of, you know, part one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. But uh, with this one here, I think I might just hit it like per topic, like, you know, how to, you know, put a trimming on a speaker or something like that, unless I happen to knock it out all today. Um, in which case, then this whole last 30 seconds doesn't apply. But anyway, thanks for hanging in there with me. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get the camera set up in a position where you can see me try to pull out these uh, these tweeters and then I'll try to also show you what I'm doing on them okay so see you in a bit I hear the music in the background because my wife is downstairs cranking up the home theater system, listening to uh, old old music that we like, you know, energetic stuff. Um, she likes cleaning the house to it and stuff. It's funny the neighbors uh, they say that um, they can they always like it when she's cleaning because they can hear the music. We have extremely nice neighbors. You know, and there's a lot of people that um, live in places that you can't really enjoy a sound system like this fully. And that's, you know, in large part because you're close to, you know, your neighbor's house or maybe live in a condo or an apartment or a townhouse or duplex, something like that. Um, but, you know, like I did with my neighbor, um, I just, you know, I mean, we're, we're friendly with him and everything. And I just let them know, hey, if this ever bothers you, like here's our here's our cell numbers, and just text me, say turn it down, and so that's uh, I think that's the best way to do it instead of you know just going ahead and setting something up, playing, and then somebody's gonna complain to you know the neighbor's gonna complain or call the cops or get a hold of a management company if you live in an apartment complex. Better off you just you know deal with folks directly and just be honest with them and say, look, I have a home theater system or I have a stereo. Once in a while, I like to turn it up. Do you mind? Like, if it bothers you, then just text me and 
I'll turn it down. It's that easy, really. So anyway, just some wisdom from an old man. So, yeah, this is really, I'm gonna bring this camera over here for a minute so you can see this mess. So this is what I'm talking about, what I wanna clean up. Because, you know, it's inside the cabinet, I'll never see it again, it sounds fine, but I really, that, that just bothers me. So I wanna clean this, these wires up, uh, the terminal ends. And this is the Zobel network and attenuation circuit that I'm working with right now. And right now, the attenuation is bypassed. So right now we're just doing the Zobel portion of it and this resistor is not doing anything. Now, one thing I wonder about, and again, I'm not an elect, uh, electrical engineer or anything like that. So if you are, that's cool. Put a comment in here. But so I had this resistor hooked up here across, you know, from the positive, basically. So the power was coming in and it was going through the resistor. Okay. And this Zobel is just tied into that side anyway. So that's on there. Then I had it coming out right here and I had the negative hooked up to here. So the thought being is that, you know, the power is going to come in. It's basically going to tree off of this, go through the Zobel and then go back through the negative side, right? So attenuating it. But I don't know, here's the question I have for you electrical engineers. Does it matter that this capacitor is sitting there with, with it not doing anything? In other words, the positive is seeing this resistor, right? Or is it seeing the resistor? That's the question. Even though it's not, you know, flowing current, does that even matter? So... That was one of the things I was thinking about messing around with. And then also the way I had it wired up, is there a reason why it would attenuate it so much when before I had a problem with it being too bright? That's what I wonder. And it didn't get that way until after I put the Zobel network on the mid-range, which is really funky. Anyway, things that make you go, hmm... So again, if you know the answers, put them in those comments, man. I'd love to know. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get this camera back where it belongs and get to work, okay? I'm going to get to work now. Make sure it's aimed good. Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out in my mind what the first thing I want to do with these is. I could just try running it without all this on there just to see what would happen. Or I was thinking about cutting that resistor off of there since I'm not using it right now. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to fire up the soldering iron though, um, and the rest of this should come apart easy enough. So I'll be back. Alright, well, you're not going to see me coming in and out of the frame. My head will get cut off, but this was kind of the best angle I could give you. And um, I'll just, you know, try to work on this tweeter right here. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Um, right now I've got the... Uh, soldering iron that's just heating up. I run this about, oh, this one here I run close to 800. Um, it seems like uh, with these thicker wires and stuff, it, it works better at 800 for me. Um, let's say I've got my hot glue gun plugged in, ready to go. And that's it, time to figure out what I'm doing here with this network. So it's gonna start with I want to take this off of here. So first things first, I guess I'll probably take just, well, I might leave them connected on the terminals for right now. 
because I know that my Zobo is hooked up okay. I just need the, the resistor taken off first because I want to see if by chance that could make some difference, you know, with having that resistor sitting there on the positive side. As the signal comes in, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's running through the speaker because I'm hooked up here. But at the same time, it's also hitting this resistor. And I don't know if that's what created what appears to be a new <laughs> kind of anomaly at the high end here. So that's the first thing I'll try is get that off of there. Um, so, all right, here we go. If it sounds different, I'd be very interested to know why. So if you know, let me know. The nice thing about uh, hot glue with um, working on speakers is that it's strong enough to hold it very well and it doesn't vibrate, nothing vibrates that it's glued on with, but you can also take it apart if you need to. The other thing I want to do is fix this. Uh, I don't want anything touching this positive side or touching this bare wire, I should say. Anything being when I stick it in the cabinet, if insulation is pushing against it or something like that, pushing it up against the, the uh, steel, especially, I want to avoid that. All right, so basically, I'm just going to try to use this as a Zobel right now without the resistor in there, that attenuation resistor. So I'm going to show you what I got uh, going on here with this. So the Zobel network, it's just going like this. It's in parallel with the positive and negative. So I guess the thought process being, the theory behind it is, is that the amplifier sees a more consistent resistance, which makes the crossover work better. I did some testing with it, speaker by speaker. I didn't, it was weird. Sometimes I thought I saw a difference, um, sometimes bigger than others, but then other times I felt like I didn't see any difference at all. So it was kind of weird, but when they're all together, it might work better, I'm not sure. This is the second one I did. It's butt ugly, I know. 
but it'll work. The um, other weird thing about this one, which isn't right, but is the uh, values for the resistor and the capacitor are actually for that Dayton uh, one and eighth inch silk dome tweeter. That was what I originally bought it for, um, but I'm using it on this one. The, <clears throat> the impedance or resistance of this tweeter is very similar to the Dayton. Uh, with GRS, they don't advertise or uh, put in there what the um, what the inductance is, though. So that's a bummer. But anyway, I'll put this in. Stop talking and put it in, Todd. got everything set up for you to see and we're roughly three feet away from the speakers about centered with the cabinet and both speakers are playing so it's going to measure it uh, measure both speakers at the same time kind of simulates open air environment what you'd hear from where you're sitting one thing I want to show before I measure these speakers to compare them against like how they were before um, is to show you the difference between having a speaker on the floor or off of the floor. Right now they're just, you know, like 12 to 13 inches off the ground. And I can tell you it's already made a big difference because I did run a sweep and it's making a big difference here where that that base, rather than having a big kind of base hump, now it's it's down a little bit more, you know. So in this region here if you are a person that appreciates more of a clear sound you might want to get them up off the floor uh, you know depending on where you have them at mileage may vary uh, that tweeter being on axis with your ear at your listening level that can have some influence as well because you have to remember that even though by picking it up off the floor, you're basically kind of uh, lowering the decibel output of the bass. So it's less bassy, it's not reflecting off the floor as quickly, but you're also raising that tweeter up, putting it right in line, you know, with your ear. So it can have kind of a, a double effect. It can have uh, twice the effect of what you might expect. So it's not just changing 
the base dropping it off as it you know gets raised up off the floor but on top of that now you've got that tweeter pointing right at your ear versus say if they're sitting straight on the floor your base might be heavier and that tweeter may be kind of below your ear level if you tilt them back in the old school time aligned get them off the floor a little bit more pointed at the listener kind of position um, then you're probably going to get the best of both worlds so uh, but I've been measuring these um, pretty much just flat on the floor throughout this whole process so uh, anyway I'm going to run this like this so you can see what it looks like up on stands and then I'll run it on the floor so that at least I can get back to kind of where I was testing it at before so hang in there with me and I've got this all queued up ready to go If you want to know more about our mixing and mastering <clears throat> services, please visit us on drmix.com. I'm going to run it with them on the floor, okay? So I'm just going to pause the video real quickly, get that set up, and then we'll measure it again. All right, so I'm set back up, and I've got the speakers now on the floor. Right? They're still in the same position as far as being three feet away, except now this microphone is just a little above where that tweeter is. So it's at 34 inches, which is about the top of this cabinet, basically. Yep. So this is kind of, I don't know, I guess a little bit of a simulation as far as like if you were you know, sitting in the couch or something, these things were sitting on the floor. This is what they would sound like. And the reason I'm doing this again is because I want to show you the difference in the bass output when you put a speaker on the floor. I'm going to purposely leave this on here so that you can Hopefully what we're going to see is it get pushed up. Well, in all honesty, it didn't push it up as much as I thought it would, but it did push it up. So now it's more level with the rest of it more in that same range that's pretty interesting I'm just going to rerun this sweep and uh, we'll see how we wind up so again this sweep is to measure the tweeter i had taken off an attenuation resistor and at first i had just bypassed it by snipping the end where the positive had went into it so basically it was kind of deadheading um, off of that so it had nowhere to go but the resistor was still sitting there um, I removed that resistor and now my frequency response isn't all wacky like it was before. Electronically, I don't know why that happens. If you know, put it in the comments. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to Dr. Mix. This is a signal test for you. Enjoy. If you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. I'm really happy with the way that top end is looking now. Um, seriously, it's way better than it was last time I measured it. Um, so I'm really curious to hear it. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, the strange thing though, is if you saw those other graphs, which this is just going back a video or two ago, that bottom end was much higher. So 
can an electronic, you know, component like that resistor deadheading at the tweeter, can that affect how that crossover or how that speaker plays and change the bottom end too? I'm asking you, like if you're an electronics engineer or you've been doing the, the speaker building and designing for a long time, <laughs> I would love to know that because that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, because I mean the other graphs, same mic, same everything was way up on that bottom end. Uh, higher than anything else, actually. So I think it had one one area in the mid-range where it might have met the same, you know, frequency line, but it was a whole bunch different. And I I don't have anything changed on this. Uh, it should be playing direct. It should have no, um, uh, you know, tone control or anything like that on there. So I'm not exactly sure uh, why I'm seeing what I'm seeing, but there it is uh so pretty weird um yeah let's uh i'm gonna try to measure one speaker and then the other speaker and see you know i did have a thought um i'm gonna try to put those little wedges underneath here that i've been using to kind of tilt them up toward me and measure them like that because that's like really the true uh listening experience that i would have and i'll actually even move the microphone back there to where I would normally sit, which is like close to this, probably six feet away or so. Um, and I'll actually position the speakers equilaterally with the microphone to see what happens. Okay, so I'm all set up now and it's much further away. This is going six feet um, in the equilateral Just so you can see. Okay. Speakers are six feet apart. So that's six feet to about the centers. And then the mic is pretty centered, about 36 inches in between the two. So we'll go ahead and run this frequency sweep. I'm not sure if I had screenshot this one or not. Hi, welcome to Dr. Mix. This is a signal test for you. Enjoy. To know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. So that's pretty interesting that just moving it, you know, three extra feet changes the frequency response like that. And a lot of that has to do, I'm sure, with the fact that we're in just a plain, untreated bedroom that's, I don't know, roughly 12 feet by 13 feet or something like that, just your average size bedroom that is uh, acting as my office slash workout area um, and speaker building <laughs> area. Um, so yeah, but that's pretty much usually where I'm sitting is uh, right there. And so that's what I'm hearing when I'm sitting there. So it's kind of cool. Um, I think that there's a whole kind of a, a niche field out there uh, that does in-room frequency tuning. And um, if I've got that right, I don't know if I 
if I'm wrong, correct me down below. But from what I understand, like people who set up home theaters and you know professional sound systems, uh, uh, probably audiophiles, right? They probably get get that dialed in really good. Um, I would say for the most part, the majority of us, you know what? Um, furniture placement comes first. Functionality trumps where the speakers go and so what we wind up with is what we wind up with i mean the sometimes they're not in the best spaces that we can get them um i know ps audio they sell like a like a kit you can order that um you use to actually place the speakers and get them sounding as good as you can just through room placement so that's pretty cool um i don't have it i'd like to get it um but uh yeah just changing it like I did three feet away, and this is in the equilateral, you know, music listening um, kind of angulation that is recommended, but that's what you see. So, uh, so anyway, um, going back to what I was doing before, uh, I want to measure each speaker individually, see how it measures out, see how that top end is, make sure it's straightened out. Uh, honestly, I don't really care that it's a little bit lower on the top end. Um, I don't necessarily need it super bright on the top end and like I say after 10,000 Hertz uh, it's all it's literally downhill for me as far as my hearing uh, when it gets near 13,000 I can literally not hear it at all um, if you can hear it let me know but I can't um, so that being said um, I'll go ahead and set this up for probably measure that speaker and then the other speaker uh, I when I do it I'm going to do it smack dab in the middle of the room kind of close up and let's see how it goes So we're three feet away. I've got, I do have a camera over that direction um, and a computer kind of uh, camera so you can see it good. And the microphone is here off to your left and it's centered with this tweeter, like right on center with it. So, uh, and it's three feet away exactly. So I've got it set at the same minus 10 dB that I was using before. Hi, welcome to Dr. Mix. This is a signal test for you. Enjoy. If you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. All right, so that was this speaker here. I'm gonna go ahead and swap it out with the other one and see how it measures. What's interesting is, is that the frequency response of one speaker, it doesn't look exactly the same as the frequency of both speakers together, which is kind of kind of wild. Um, it seems like it seems like one speaker alone. It's better in some respects, and in others, it's a little worse. Like right now, just one single speaker, it's got kind of a little, you know, up and down uh, a valley and then a spike uh, right at the crossover for the tweeter. Now in the other measurements. We really didn't see that it just carried straight across and then kind of went down and then level again so it from a listening position or from three feet away with both speakers running it's almost as if that that high end is um i don't know how it's working together <laughs> it should be canceling each other out comb you always hear about comb filtering and all that stuff i would expect it to do more of that uh but it almost seems like the two of them working together in harmony were, um, you know, 
uh, better. Now on the bass end, the single speaker seems to look better than both speakers combined. On the bass end, you know, it's, it's much more level. Um, so that, the only, thing, only explanation I can come up with for that is that with both woofers running in this small room, these big 15 inch woofers, they may be canceling each other out in certain areas. That's the only thing I could figure. Or if the base management is so screwed up in this room right now that I'm getting funky behavior from it. Um, at some point I want to move these downstairs to where I have my home theater set up where it's a much bigger room and uh, I can play them more uh, at a louder level, I guess you want to call it. Uh, just something where they have more room to breathe. Um, but uh, for right now, just testing them in here. So I'll go ahead and swap those out and we'll get going. Just for snicks and giggles, let's do one sweep to see how it looks like against the other speaker. Hi, welcome to Dr. X. This is a signal test for you. Enjoy. If you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. So this is pretty wild, right? That, that tracked almost identical with this one. I mean, like really, really close. Um, I'm sure if you looked at it, like expanded it, so you're looking at every half dB or something, it might be like a little bit different, but for the most part, it tracked it pretty much just right on the same level. And that's swapping out the speakers. This one isn't even the same spot that the other one was. The other one was over here. So my question to you is this, and you can answer in the comments down below. How important is it to spend more money for a matched set of tweeters and you DIY guys and audiophiles you'll know what I'm talking about uh, if you've not heard of uh, matched tweeters before it's a thing um, and basically you know like let's say hypothetically this tweeter was a higher end tweeter and retailed for I don't know 80 bucks right a matched set may cost two three four times that much and they so, because every single speaker is a little bit different from each other, so they match them as closely as possible. I'm sure that it's a painstaking process. They're probably looking at it at kind of a granular level um, with a much more focused, uh, you know, frequency response, like within a given uh, variance. Nonetheless, though, by the time it hits your ears at your house, wherever you're sitting or even three feet away, like here, you can see it doesn't make a whole lot of difference in the end result, at least as far as I can see. Um, and not only is it just is it two completely different tweeters, and the fact that I swapped them out, they may not be in the exact same position, or this one might not be in the exact same position that one was, um, but you've also got a whole bunch of other variables involved. You've got you know, get two other drivers in there. You've got the crossover network, the wiring, the terminals. I mean, anything could could uh, influence that, right? So, if you're going to spend four hundred dollars on a set of match tweeters, like how important is it really? And like, and this is just me talking, right? You might, if you have a different opinion, I respect it. And um, if you are an experienced speaker builder or designer. Um, you probably, you know, there's probably reasons for it. 
uh, that I'm not aware of. But for me, does a tweeter have to sound good? Yes. Should it measure well? Yes. More importantly though, in my opinion, is that it needs to cross over well with the mid-range. If you're using a three-way, like I am, it's got to cross over well with the mid-range. I think that's probably paramount. That's probably the most important thing, is that it carries over well and that it kind of maintains a, you know, more or less even sound pressure level. Uh, if it was a two-way, then you'd be going between woofer and tweeter. And again, you'd want it to cross over really well. Now, <clears throat> a tweeter's frequency response is going to be more important if you are taking it down under 5,000, like if you were crossing this over, say, at 2,500, which I'm sure it could do. Um, it's going to be more influential, like the better that tweeter is, it, it's going to... Like this tweeter here actually has a really flat response, way lower than what I've got it crossed over at. Um, and it cuts off at 15,000. But um, as I mentioned, that high stuff, you know, where this thing picks up at 5,000 and above, that's really high frequencies. Like, um, there's not always a ton of musical information up there. And you, your hearing may drop off uh, dramatically at a certain point like mine does, right? So for me, um, once it hits, like 5,000 is loud in my ear, 7,000 is loud in my ear. As it goes from 7,000 to 10,000, it starts just waning off. After 10,000, I mean, I can hear it, but it it's, doesn't seem loud, it doesn't seem annoying or anything like that. Um, and then after 13,000, it's literally silent like I cannot hear it at all on the lower end of the scale you know they say people can hear humans can hear from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz uh, for me that's not the case um, and on the low end I cannot hear 20 Hertz I can feel 20 Hertz I can feel and start to hear almost like a hum at roughly mid 20s to 30 hertz so i'm feeling it and i'm kind of picking up this you know i can kind of sense that in my ear and then 40 hertz <clears throat> i can actually hear it you know like i can say audibly yes that i can definitely hear that so my hearing range and, and the frequency response for these speakers that i want to be uh really uh, i want to get them nailed is that area that I am that I can hear in um so from about uh like oh you know 40 hertz is a nice bump that's where a lot of loud bass comes in it sounds really good so you know ideally from about 40 hertz to you know say 12,000 I'd like it you know really nice um above and beyond that you know subsonic and then in the, in the high frequencies um, I think personally it's more important that it can go lower. So uh, if I had a choice between a set of like real high-end speakers that could go from um, let's say 60 hertz to uh, you know 18,000 hertz plus minus 2 dB you know that'd be an incredible speaker and it, I'm sure it would sound great um, but it wouldn't provide nearly as big a sound stage as if it went down lower than that, you know, in the, in the thirties, twenties. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, you know, my thought process on it. World according to Todd, right? All right. So wrapping this up, I'm going to do one last measurement. This time it's going to be a three foot equilateral triangle, and it's going to be both speakers running. And I want to see the sum total one last time, take a screenshot of it. And I think that's going to be pretty much a wrap for uh, messing around with the crossovers and vocals and attenuation and all. I think, you know what, I mean, in-room response here, I'm seeing, say, plus minus 10 dB. Um, I don't know. I'll take it. I mean, most of it has fallen in an area that's more plus minus 5, which is, I don't know for sure. <laughs> 
audiophiles, DIY guys, you'll know. Um, I, to me, I think in an open environment, untreated room, that that's pretty respectable. Um, you know, to have a, a good portion of it, hugging at, say, where my reference line is, negative dB, uh, negative 80 dB. Um, you know, the fact that it's hugging along that line, say plus minus uh, 5 dB for the most part, and then there's a few areas where it, you know, goes above and beyond. Uh, so kind of, you know, taking up, say, a, a 20 dB uh, range, you know. Um, and these are broken up into 10 dBs here. Um, some previous tests I had, they were 20 each. So I fixed that setting. Um, but yeah, uh, I'd say that for, for a vintage set of speakers, uh, got almost no money in. Uh, for what they sound like um, That that's respectable and I can maybe then I can focus on some of the more uh, OCD type stuff that's bugging me like the maybe fixing the, Putting a trimmer in on the mid-range and fixing the wiring inside and you know at the terminal uh, ends and all that so uh, We'll see what happens with this sweep and then I'll uh, in another video. I'll cover that other stuff. I I'm, I'm good today. I did a lot of a lot of testing and moving things around and stuff. So um, I am uh, pretty much ready to call it quits. So anyway, I'll pick this up another time as far as, uh, you know, doing anything further with, you know, making them look better. Reason to make another video too. I've got another project coming up soon too. Um, so I'll be introducing that real quick. Not real quick today though, you'll have to wait. Okay, so the plan is I'm going to do one frequency sweep with both speakers running. They are three feet from center to center. Okay. They're three feet from the tweeter to the microphone. Okay. And they are completely, you know, just facing out straight and flat. So I'll take a sweep like that. I'm going to compare it first against that one from the one single speaker, which I've already shown is very similar between the two cabinets, regardless of all the variabilities in these, um, or all the variables <laughs> in these they are still uh, running very, very close frequency responses. So I'm going to run both of them together now and let's see what happens with this and see if what I said was true about it, kind of straightening out the, the high end, but messing up the base a little bit. Uh, so that's one thing I want to see. Then I'm going to clear it and just run one frequency sweep, both speakers, and that's the last frequency response for these guys for a long time. Well, I can tell you already, I can, I can tell you already, it, it was different. It seemed like it was, you know, a little bit more level on the top end, and on the bottom end, it, it we had some base coupling there at the end, at the bottom end, bringing it up, and then it kind of, you know, sunk down like it, we were seeing before. So that's pretty, pretty wild. So if you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. Okay, so now I'm gonna do my last frequency response test with these speakers. I think I'm done messing with the network in it, and uh, I think at this point it's just you know final details on them, and, and then they're completely done. So yeah, this will be the last one. Hi, and welcome to Doctor Mix. This is a signal test for you. Enjoy.
you want to know more about our mixing and mastering services, please visit us on drmix.com. See you later. All right, so pretty much as predicted. Um, get down here with you so I could kind of show you. Hopefully my pointer thing will work. So you can see that both speakers combined can clean up the high end. Somehow they're working together in harmony to where the end result at this mic is what you're seeing here. So I'm gonna kind of show you where that begins and ends. So the crossover point of the mid-range is 800. It's 750 to 800. So we can see we got a little drop there. And all the way along here, that's all mid-range. And right in this area, in the 40, what is it, 4,700 to 5,000 range. 5,000 is the actual advertised crossover. There's a tweeter picking up, and then that's pretty darn level, all the way to, like I say, like 10,000. Like, I can't really hear it past 10,000. I mean, I can hear it, but not that good. By 13,000, I'm right there. I can't even hear it anymore. And then just past that, at 15, what is that? 14, 7, 19, so almost 15,000. That's where it really drops off sharp. Now on the woofer side of it, we go from this say, 800 range. And I would say for a 15 inch woofer, that's not bad. I mean, from, you know, if we're looking at this negative 80 dB line is as our reference, or if you're looking at the negative 70 line, it's 10 dB apart. I mean, from, you know, 18, 20 on up, it's pretty much, I mean, plus minus 5 dB, 10 dB. Holy cow. I think, <laughs> I could be wrong, but I think that's pretty good for in-room response of two separate speakers running at the same time. So 15-inch uh, woofers at that. Okay, anyway, long story short, um, I always say that, but the story always gets longer, so I apologize for that, getting old. Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> this is really coming to a wrap here on these speakers. Unless I start comparing them to other speakers, uh, I'm pretty happy with the way they, they sound and the way that they measure. I'm good with it. Um, leaps and bounds better than the original. Uh, Jensen was um, and yeah I made use of the the extra speakers that I had laying around the house the drivers and I was able to film all this stuff and share it with you guys and ask you questions that hopefully one day I'll get answered in the comments um, but uh, for a DIY vintage build out I'd say it's a success um, I'll do one last video that shows me you know Get them all finalized. It's not going to be a dramatic difference, but it's just to me finishing up that speaker where you can just say it's done. You know, you can have it in your house. You can show it to people. Uh, whatever. You know, you decide to sell it. Uh, you decide to trade them. Whatever. It's like okay, you know that they're solid, right? They're they're as good as they can get. So I want to go through that uh, last step and uh, share that with you guys as well. And then I'm going to be on to the next project, which three separate speaker cabinets right now and I don't know which one to pick first if anybody's watching this video and wants to see me do a speaker project uh, I've got a, an old realistic 12 inch no uh, 8 inch two-way speaker uh, acoustic suspension uh, I've got that set I've got a pair of Yamos it's a six and a half inch woofer three-way system uh, and then I've also got a pair of uh, RCA uh, three-way speakers. I want to say it's a 10-inch woofer. Um, 
So anyway, those are the three ones that I have coming up. I'm thinking about starting with the with the bigger one, um, just to kind of follow suit from huge to taper on down to the smallest one, maybe. Um, anyway, that's it, man. Thanks for joining me, and uh, I appreciate you watching and appreciate your comments and uh, just hang in there with me, and I'll get another video out there uh, pretty soon. Thank you.